Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure of discussing with you today the concept of measuring species diversity using field techniques. That's right, a really important topic in ecological studies, which is, as you can see from these students that are standing in this river with a net, they're trying to capture organisms and therefore determine the types and number of species present in a particular community in order to determine its uh, health and well-being. And so this conversation that we're going to have today about that is uh, revolving around this concept. In the spring of 2019, the United Nations re released a report that was pretty sobering in nature. It was describing an unprecedented decline in species diversity and number of species on our planet. And so uh, transformative change is needed. And so this uh, is our rationale for this discussion. And it's also, I would say, a, a call to sta stand up and do something about it. And so in order for us to understand what is necessary, let's, let's discuss a few basic fundamentals about species and how they exist within a community. And so as you can see this forest right here in front of us, um, there's, let's just say that there's a uh, hundred trees and we're just counting up the number of different species here. And you can see there's A, B, C, and D representing different species in this particular forest. And so a definition right out of the gate is that is a measure of alpha diversity. And now alpha diversity implies the Greek letter A implies that there's other types of diversities, and we're going to get into that in this discussion, but basically it's species richness, the number of different species found in a particular community. So in this, in this uh, community right here, there's four different ones, and so alpha diversity is four. And so take a look at this community, com community number two. Now, what's interesting about this is if, you're, if you recall, there's one, two, three, four different species, just like the first community, but it's really different in appearance, isn't it? And so even though the alpha diversity is the same between community one and community two, the evenness is different. And so when you look at species richness between community one and community two, they're the same, four. But then when you look at relative abundance, and so do you notice here species A is kind of dominating, and so there's an, there's an unevenness to this particular community something to consider. So I wanted to establish that because conservation biologists, which are those biologists that specialize in the protection of biodiversity, or ecologists that are measuring species in a particular community, uh, need to know these particular, uh, this particular information. And so not all communities are forests. And so I want to discuss in this particular video a river community. And so you might think, all right, uh, what are the organisms or species that are found in this river? And so the first thing pro probably that you might be thinking about it are fish. And of course, those are important. But I want to look at what are called macro invertebrates, these kind of small bugs that are found in the river. And they're found on usually on the bottom, uh, and they're clinging onto rocks. They're what are called benthic organisms living on the bottom. And what's interesting, it's kind of funny that they're called macro invertebrates because macro in insinuates large, but in fact, they're kind of these small little guys, but they're, they're called macro invertebrates. They have no backbone. Uh, they're often larva uh, of insects. And what's interesting about them is that you could see them without a microscope. And so they're important, really important in the community that is a river, a freshwater river, because uh, fish are needing to eat these. And so uh, the, these macroinvertebrates might be eating algae or bacteria, and they're, the fish then are eating them. So they're a crucial part of the, the food chain. And as we're going to see in this video, they're also a measure of the health of this particular river. And so to identify species diversity helps conservation biologists establish, establish which parts of rivers and which rivers indeed are in need of protection. It'd be nice to be able to protect everything, but uh, in terms of funding, uh, you have to identify which particular uh, area is, is in need of most protection. And so you might be thinking, what's the problem with the river? It looks great. And so one of the issues affecting a river is that 
um, farmers like to plant their crops very close and adjacent to river systems because of obvious reasons. It's a great source of irrigation. But one of the problems with this is that sometimes fertilizer in the, uh, or just soil nutrients in general, things like nitrogen, nitrates, nitrites, phosphates, will leach or run off into the river system. And that can affect, in a negative way, deleteriously, the organisms that are found in the river. And so uh, just a little th uh, discussion about abiotic or non-living factors. Uh, dissolved oxygen in the, in the water is one of the more important abiotic factors. Uh, every animal needs oxygen, especially the fish. And oxygen normally just sim simply dissolves into the river or it can be mixed in... in uh, these riffle areas, uh, and photosynthetic organisms, microscopic plants and, and aquatic plants in general will increase the amount of dissolved oxygen through photosynthesis. But one of the issues is if agriculture is running excess phosphate, for example, into the river, what can happen is algae uh, will increase in terms of number because they're being limited by the amount of phosphate. And so when those algae decompose, bacteria break that down and then consume the oxygen and so the amount of dissolved oxygen is reduced and it can also affect the pH uh, in the river. So these are abiotic factors to be considered. So using fill techniques, <clears throat> you can go into a river and you can simply sample that and determine the amount of dissolved oxygen available and that's that's useful in terms of measuring the quality of the of the river. But what's more important is that it's not obvious always obvious um, from those readings whether or not the river is uh, healthy or not. And so uh, field techniques are needed to determine this. And so this is what we're going to be talking about. So basically, this is a bioassessment. So we're going in and we're trying to evaluate like an ass assessment, uh, determining the number of species that are present. And maybe that is some indication of the quality of the river. And, and whether or not it needs protecting or not. And so these aquatic insects, these macroinvertebrates, are common and they live in the stream. And so uh, students or scientists can go out to the river and collect these. And some of the microorganisms or macroinvertebrates are more tolerant or less tolerant to um, pollution, if you will, to the river. And so that's going to need to be considered. And so they're collected and they're uh, determined, the species is determined in, determined using uh, dichotomous keys or taxonomic identification keys. And that uh, is basically a life survey. It's a sampling of the river in order to determine um, what organisms are present. And so they'll vary depending on how much pollution is present in, in, the, in the river. And so just to give you a sense of this, let me uh, close down the slideshow just for a second and show you a, uh, a video of what I'm talking about. And so you're really able to, using a net uh, downstream, um, uh, one particular person will go into the river and go around, find a rock. And these little macroinvertebrates like to live on the bottom of the rocks. And so it's kind of cool. You have to go in there and you rub the rock like this. And those macroinvertebrates literally... Uh, get pushed off the rock because you're, you're, you're scraping them. And then they'll move down the river and, the, and the, the net will collect them. And then after the net collects them, you're then able to, let me go back to the, to the slideshow here, you're then able to um, take those and classify them. And so this is the approach. And so uh, there are uh, information that can be obtained to determine what organisms are most sensitive to pollution. And so that's what's called as a sensitivity uh, category. And so the bugs are collected and then using a pitcher key that I mentioned before, you, you group them into uh, most sensitive category to pollution, uh, intermediate category, for example, this riffle beetle or, or uh, a crane fly is in the intermediate group. And then there's the third category, which is tolerant. So these are organisms that can pretty much live in the river no matter what the conditions are. They're, they're like, for example, this dragon uh, damselfly can, can tolerate. And so what you would do is 
I'm gonna hang out on this diagram just for a little bit. What you do is you basically go out there and you collect these organisms and then you classify them, as you remember in that, in that ice tray, by kind and then you determine what species they are. And then you literally record them. For example, the number of mayflies here, the number of stoneflies uh, in this particular category of sensitivity. And then the total number, if you remember this, you take the number of organisms that you found, the number of mayfly, over the total number in the sensitive category, and you'll come, come up with something called the abundance category. So the relative abundance. Now, in terms of abundance percentages, some will be rare, and that's determined by less than 5%. Some will be common, and some will be dominant. In other words, highly present. And you do the same thing for the intermediate group and the same thing for the tolerant group. You count the number of organisms that you find and then take that number divided by the total number and you'll come up with an abundance category. And you're like, okay, what do you do with that? But then you apply it to this, this uh, table right here. Now, if your abundance is rare and you're sensitive, you're given this value of S. And so there, as you can see, these different numbers are present. So let me go back to the previous slide. You take those S values and you add them all up in a, what's known as a sum score. And then you add all three sum scores together. And that's what's referred to as the biological index. And that will determine water quality. And so if the number's high, uh, the river would be considered to be excellent. So that indicates the best water and healthy habitat for uh, organisms that are living there. So one can determine this. Now, Say your river is, um, is not doing well in terms of maybe it's poor or fair. And so decisions need to be made. Well, maybe, maybe um, we should compare one site next to a farm area versus a, a pristine area where there's no agriculture going on in order to compare. And so that's often considered to be a reference site. And then there's other ways in which uh, an ecologist or a conservation biologist can step up their game a little bit. Now you can see here along this river, there looks to be like sticks sticking in there. And those are actually willow trees. Uh, they're cuttings. And so if you're familiar with this, these cuttings of a tree will actually develop their own root system and, and, uh, and foliage over time. And the thought is, if you can plant these things, I know this isn't the best soil along the river per se, it's a little bit of sand, but if these trees uh, start to form, and, and what is important about that is that along a river, it's referred to as a riparian forest. The riparian forest can then collect some of the nitrates and nitrites and phosphates before it enters into the river. And so you can look at and evaluate this over a long period of time and see if that's an effective technique or not. And so ecologists in general want to determine which areas have the highest species diversity because that's an indicator of whether or not the, the river is going to be needing to be protected or not. Because the thing is, you know, if funds are limited, as I, as I referred, and you can't consider like, well, it's just going to go out and protect every river. And it's like, well, you have to identify which ones are in most need and then uh, make decisions, management decisions based on that. And so there's a quantitative definition of species that's been developed where you're comparing the overall differences in diversity along a geographical scale. In other words, along a span of the river. And I mentioned alpha diversity before, which was species richness. And let, let's get back to that idea, if you don't mind. Say I'm looking at this particular river right here, and these letters represent the different species that I've been able to identify. So let's look at this, one, two, three, four, five. And those are, those are the same here, one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So in general, the number of different species in the area, the average, if you take that, is six. So the alpha diversity in this particular river community is six. Now, there's something called gamma, and this is the Greek symbol gamma, and that was the Greek symbol alpha right there. So here's gamma. gamma. So it's a species throughout the whole region. And so the total number of different species throughout the whole region. So if you look at this A, B, C, D, E, F, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and then uh, seven. So there's seven different species found in the area. So that's referred to as gamma diversity. And the last one is beta. So beta represents 
the gamma diversity divided by the alpha diversity. And so it represents a, a composition or a rate of change as you move across a, a region of the river. So if you just simply take alpha diversity, which was six, I'm mean, sorry, seven, and divide it by six, the, the beta diversity is a number 1.2. And you're like, okay, that, that's super, but what does it mean? Well, you would wanna compare that with another river and see, well, which has the greater beta diversity. So check this out. Here's a different river. So here you go, one, two, three, here's four, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so, uh, or five. And so the alpha diversity is four. And then the number of different species, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So gamma is ten. So do you remember to divide, you would get beta diversity, which is two point seven. Now you would divide gamma by alpha and you come up with 2.7. So 2.7 is greater than 1.2. And so as it turns out, if funds were only available, remember that question to protect one particular river, which one would you select? So again, it's not that easy either. And you're like, well, this is a, a greater beta diversity. Maybe this is more important, needs to be protected. Maybe this one, because it has a lower beta diversity, this one needs to be protected. And so it depends on the situation. And so uh, I wanted to conclude with this, that hopefully uh, through watching this, you'll understand the importance of measuring species diversity and recognizing that that's one of the major goals of a conservation biologist and ecologist to go into an area community and determine alpha, beta, and gamma diversity in order to establish uh, important management techniques. Now, there's a lot of habitat in the world, needless to say, and so one of the newer uh, trends that are occurring, which I find kind of interesting, and I wanted to finish with this, is this something called citizen science. And so uh, the science community is asking all of us to be able to step in and using uh, every means available to go out and sample the number of species found in your local habitat. How cool is that? And then you can go to, to the internet and record the number of different species in a particular area. It could be a forest, it could be birds, it could be um, vernal pools, and you're looking at uh, amphibians that are found there and classifying them. Now, not everyone's an expert at classifying uh, organisms, and so we also have the ability, this video isn't really about that, but we have the ability to, uh, if we don't know what a species is, we could take that organism and extract DNA from them and look at a particular gene. In particular, it's a, a mitochondrial gene that will identify species diversity using DNA barcoding, which is really cool. And so that gene is then amplified and then it's sent into a sequencing center and then you can determine what species it is based on that. So. Hopefully you enjoyed this discussion of measuring species diversity using field techniques. Thanks for watching.